this is not good. Okay. I'm not sure what we're going to do. Test, test. <laughs> test, test. I think I'm going to call to order the meeting. It seems like our technology issues have been resolved. Welcome, everyone. We have a quorum, and we'll begin the Oklahoma City Arts Commission's October 18, 2021, regularly scheduled meeting. 
Before the commission votes on each item, I will ask staff to provide details on each case. I will ask if the applicant has anything to add, and I will ask if any members of the public wish to speak on the item. If you wish to address the Arts Commission, you will be recognized. You will go to the side podium one at a time and state your name and address for the record and begin your comments. Please limit those comments to no more than three minutes. We will now conduct a roll call vote. Mark, can you do the roll call? Roll Thank call. you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Commissioner Bailey. Here. Commissioner Kovash. Here. Commissioner Salyer. Here. Commissioner Booker. Commissioner Chambers. Here. Commissioner Cooper. Present. Commissioner Duong. Commissioner Eichmann. Here. Commissioner Hill. Here. Commissioner Loftus. Present. Commissioner Mossant. Here. Commissioner Ramirez. Commissioner Seward. Here. Commissioner Smalling. Commissioner Williams. Madam Chair, that completes the roll call. You have quorum. Our first item is item two, approval of the meeting minutes from the September 20th, 2021 regular meeting. I hope everyone has read through the minutes and if there are no corrections to be brought to my attention, I will entertain a motion in a second. Move approval. Um, I have a motion from Commissioner Cooper and a second from Commissioner Seward. Any further discussion? Hearing none, um, we will need to do a roll call today, I believe, because we don't have everybody logged in. Is that correct? Yes. Mark, can you do a roll call vote for us? Thank you, Madam Chair. Commissioner Bailey? Yes. Commissioner Kovash? Yes. Commissioner Salyer? Yes. Commissioner Chambers? Yes. Commissioner Cooper? Yes. Commissioner Eichmann? Yes. Commissioner Hill? Commissioner Loftus? Yes. Commissioner Mossant? Yes. Commissioner Seward? Yes. Madam Chair, that completes the roll vote. The motion passes. Thank you. Now to item three. Items for discussion and action. Item 3A, Oklahoma, Scenic View by Beatrice Mallorca, Visual Design Studio, LLC. 1% for art for the interior of the Municipal Courts Building at 701 Couch Drive in Ward 6. Randy, can you present this item for us? Thank you, Commissioner Bailey. Good afternoon, Commissioners. You see here on this slide, uh, so, it never fails if I have, if I put in a bells and whistles in the display. Maybe that's the problem, Robbie. Maybe. So all this was meant to fade in and out and be really, really sweet. But anyway, uh, it's just going to give it to you all at once. In the upper left-hand corner, you see the new, actually this is the architectural rendering from AGG from about 2015 of the uh, Municipal Court building over at 701 Couch Drive. And uh, in 2017, when it was completed, Judge Philippa James said, let's get it on at the, at the opening ceremony. Uh, it's been a delight to work with her on this project, her and her staff. Uh, you see in the lower right-hand corner, the wall inside the building that the artwork was designated to go on. Uh, the RFQ asked for a combination of functional and decorative art, uh, specifically the uh, court administration staff wanted a table, a sculptural table that would go against that wall that would allow people that are in the court building doing conducting business, paying fines or getting court papers to come over and have a place where they could easily uh, stand or sit as the case may be and write and fill in their papers. And then in addition to the sculptural table, uh, artists could have proposed various other artistic elements that would go on the wall, sculptural lighting or various other elements. This is the work that was selected. It is Oklahoma Scenic View by Beatrice Mallorca. And uh, the reason that the um, bottom of the base is circled is to point out how in her design she, per she balanced everything and the central element of the sculptural table per perfectly lines up with the terrazzo floor element. Uh, and then uh, the other two elements extend on either side. So the tall desk, for, so that's for a person, a taller person standing up and writing is at 45 inches off the floor. The standard desk, which is actually higher than desk height, uh, but standard is 38 and three quarters. 
And then the ADA desktop is at 29 and three quarters, and it's designed so, of course, anybody could, uh, that, that uses a wheelchair can pull in easily underneath that and uh, conveniently be able to use that, that surface. The central element is constructed of hand-polished stainless steel. You see that the countertops are an antique maroon granite, which matches the granite that is already used in the courthouse. And then the steel elements are going to be treated with the Japanese brown patina, and after the patina sets up, then a lacquer finish goes over that, as it does over the stainless steel. This is a view, as if, if you were on the second floor looking down, then you would see uh, this element. You see the other windows where people go to the, go to the windows, and they extend on around to what, that's, that's the north side, where you see somebody standing at some of the other places. Uh, there's also other windows that they can go to on the east side. Uh, at various times of the week, all of those windows will be full, and there will be a lot of people in this lobby area. Uh, oftentimes, uh, the uh, citizens are given pieces of paper that they have to fill out, and then they have to go somewhere to fill those out. So that is the uh, reason for the function of the table. And these are the decorative elements that go on the back of the wall. They were inspired by floral designs, uh, well, by, by Beatrice's uh, experience of the native wildflowers, actually. Uh, we know from another project that she's very highly influenced by those, but also she designed them so that they uh, coordinate with, the, with design motifs that go throughout the buildings in the Civic Plaza. All you have to do is look around or look around at the outside of the City Hall, Civic Center Music Hall, the County Courthouse, and you'll see the uh, modified, or either the Art Deco or modified Art Deco design elements. And here you see a close-up of those elements. This is a $48,000 project. The building, of course, is complete. So we're not on any particular timetable, but I know that Beatrice wants to start just as soon as she is um, assuming that you um, give your recommendation today. She wants to start just as soon as uh, council approves it and a, a, uh, an artist agreement is uh, signed. Now, I want to depart from uh, the, this part of the uh, story to tell you about two other things. Well, one of them has directly to do with this. Beatrice did one of the best presentations I've ever seen. Very, very effective. She answered questions that everybody had before they had a chance to come up, specifically in regard to the ADA issues. She researched really, really thoroughly and just said, I did this for this reason, I did this for this reason, and so on. Also, she did a fabulous reveal in uh, <laughs> just kind of a, a very masterful way of, of showing her, uh, of revealing her design that really got everybody's attention. So that was one thing I just wanted to give a shout out to Beatrice about. In addition to great design, she also did a fantastic presentation. And uh, the other part of the story has to do with the selection committee. We had a person on the selection committee, a, an apprentice named Nylena Brewer. Uh, Nylena is a young artist uh, who was spotted by our our uh, own Mr. Mark Collier out uh, as she was working on uh, some art in somewhere in Northwest Oklahoma City. I can't remember exactly where it was. Mark brought her to our attention. Uh, we followed up, talked to her. Uh, she was happy to have technical assistance from us and um, we saw this opportunity to get her to be an apprentice on the selection committee so she could participate and see what public art is like from the inside out. Now. Uh, she's just recently been selected by the Arts Council of Oklahoma City to be involved in the Fresh Paint uh, mural competition that's coming up. So, uh, Mark, thank you very much. Once again, you did a good thing, and Elena's career is off and running. So, with all of that, this is Oklahoma Scenic View. Thank you, Randy. Um, would the applicant like to present any information or make any comments? No? Do we, is, she's not here. She's not here today. Okay. Um, any members of the public that wish to speak on this item? Okay, I would open the floor for any questions or comments from commissioners. Commissioner Seward? I have uh, one question. Uh, I don't have my mic on yet. 
Um, how easily can this uh, Japanese brown be touched up? Because the fact it goes to the floor, it will probably get kicked and stuffed or things hit it, a wheelchair could scrape against it or any of those issues. Can it be touched up fairly easily? And can she provide for that? Yes, uh, so the, um, in, a, in a case like that, the area that is scuffed up, you can, <clears throat> excuse me, you can apply the patina again. It takes, it may take 24 hours for the patina to reach the same color that it had before. And then you can come back and spray or brush on the lacquer finish. So it is, uh, it, it's capable of being touched up periodically as needed. And this is something that the maintenance staff could keep up with? Yes. A, yes, it's okay. not, it's, it's not technically difficult. It is Very something, good, thank yeah. you. Commissioner Kovash. I'm not even sure this question has an answer, but this is a significant piece and it's going in the courthouse. And I, is there gonna be any kind of conversation between y'all in terms of maintaining this piece? Because I'm just worried in three to four years, it's just gonna be beat to, beat to heck and um, maybe they don't have the same passion that we do for making sure these pieces of art are kept as, you know, in good condition. Well, my impression is from Judge James and the court staff, LaShawn Thompson, uh, Galen Keaton in particular, that they are on it. And um, given the instructions, the care and maintenance instructions that Beatrice will give them, and that's required, that's always a part of every artist agreement is that a maintenance uh, a manual basically is provided that they will that they will make sure that everything is done to keep it in as good a condition as possible. It may be that some later time down the line, it might be a good idea to completely strip the piece of the lacquer finish and come back and redo everything again. But short-term maintenance, we expect it uh, to be maintained properly all the time. Any other comments? Commissioner Cooper? Uh, I just wanted to, um, I guess, applaud the uh, court for taking a, a utilitarian object that is necessary for, for the operation there and, uh, and deciding to turn it into a piece of art. I, I think that's quite lovely that, they, that they've done that to put something really interesting. Uh, I love the way that uh, Beatrice has borrowed from the decor elements that kind of run through the various municipal projects and uh, tied it together in this, uh, in this desk and made it very, uh, and the research she did in making it usable for the various elements, including ADA and uh, people who stand, people who want to sit. I think she's just done a remarkable job and I think it's wonderful. Thank you. Any motions? I, I would like to move a recommendation. Okay. And <laughs> oh, do, with, I have a, do I have a second? With the condition of the VERA waiver, I believe, was yes. part of staff recommendation. Correct. I would and, second. And then a second from Commissioner Salyer. Any further discussion? Hearing none, Mark, can you do a roll call vote? Thank you, Madam Chair. Commissioner Bailey? Yes. Commissioner Kovash? Yes. Commissioner Salyer? Yes. Commissioner Chambers? Yes. Commissioner Cooper? Yes. Commissioner Eichmann? Yes. Commissioner Hill? Yes. Commissioner Loftus? Yes. Commissioner Mossant? Yes. Commissioner Seward? Yes. Madam Chair, that completes the vote. The motion passes. Thank you. Moving on to item 3B. Beautiful, mystical, exploding sun clouds, taste metallic gift painting, 2010, by Damien Hurst with participation from Wayne Coyne work on loan for the interior of the MAPS 3 Convention Center at 500 South Robinson Avenue in Ward 6. Robbie, can you present this item? Yes, uh, Mr. Hurst, the artist, uh, primary artist, intentionally named these with very long titles at that time in his career, so sorry about that. So in, uh, you know, in the circles that Wayne Coyne and the Flaming Lips have traveled in, in their worldwide performances, they, of course, met Damien Hurst years ago, back in 2010. Um, Mr. Hurst invited 
the Flaming Lips to his big studio in, in Bristol where he had had a big warehouse and he had um, commissioned the creation of this spin painting device. And this was, very, this was some of his earlier work where he invited each band member to work on a spin painting with him. Of course, Wayne Coyne got the biggest one because he was the, the front, front man for the Flaming Lips. And so they created this together and it's 18 by 18 feet. And so this was once placed in the ceiling of the womb back when the Flaming Lips were at the womb. And when they were moving out to make way for Factory Obscura, they called our office for technical assistance because they needed um, an art handler to remove this carefully for them because they knew that the value was a couple of million dollars. And so uh, we did recommend a couple of art handlers. They ended up hiring Tony Morton with Casson Contemporary who carefully removed it, uh, you know, rolled it, crated it, and it's then been in climate controlled storage since that time. And so I think many of you know that Scott Booker is the agent for the Flaming Lips. And so in 2019, Scott contacted um, our office and said, Wayne would really rather than just having this sit in a crate in a climate controlled warehouse, it's not the kind of thing that you, you know, you your home, it just fits in your home. You really, we really need to have a public site and we'd be willing to put it on loan for say a period of, of 10 years and possibly more, you know, depending on how well received it was. And so at that time, the convention center was under construction. Um, and we talked with the architects and there were a couple of walls that could be identified for this very large piece. And so we later waited till we met in our typical fashion, we met with the selection committee over the 1% for art for the convention center. And at that time, because of what, what they were working on for the interior of the convention center, the committee really wanted to wait. They, want, they said, you know, we know this is gonna stay in a crate. We know it's gonna be climate controlled. It'll still be there when, we, when it's done. We wanna complete our selection process and get the interior work in the two atria of the convention center completed and then look back at these walls and see what might be appropriate. So that's what we did. And so we're coming back now. We met with the selection committee on September 21st to consider the work plus the cost. Some of the terms that have been proposed by the lender are a 10 year loan with an extension based on uh, mutually agreed to terms at the end of the 10 year loan period the lender would be responsible for the removal of the work from the site and transporting the, pa the painting to whatever location they wanted, whether it was another buyer or back to climate control. If the city requests removal though, prior to the 10 year period, that they would like the city to be responsible for that removal cost. The lender requests that the city use CASM Contemporary again, which which staff agrees would be the right thing to do because they're the only people that have removed it, created it. It would make sense that there would be this continuity of understanding what's inside the crate and its condition, you know, because they were the last people to see it before it got in the crate. Um, also that we would agree to ensure under the city's fine art policy, which all the artworks in our possession, we do put on our fine art policy. Um, that the lender will be required to obtain the proof of valuation because this is something that the lender personally uses for any tax related purposes. Um, and also to validate the city's insurance coverage um, because they're claiming right now that it's worth two and a half million dollars. So we need to make sure that that's the exact value. And that the city would pay all costs for transporting the, pa the painting to crate to the convention center site, stretching the canvas. Because of the size of this, it has to be brought to the site, introduced to the environment of the convention center, and then stretched over a period of 30 days. This would have constant care. It's like constant care and feeding for 30 days. The convention center operator has set aside the month of December would be optimum for this because in January, their schedule just goes crazy. And so they would set aside a portion of the ballroom to do this 
and then the uh, art handler would have to come every day to do this stretching. Also that we would want to have a conservator report and that would be to, you know, all of the conditions of this painting that we would pay for so that to make sure that what we received, that there, it would be accurately reported. Um, also again, for you know, at the end of the 10 year period so that uh, we would know if there was any damage during that period of time and who was responsible. You know, the required insurance. There's also equipment rental. Um, the way that an 18 by 18 foot painting has to be hoisted in the air, there's two ways to do it. And one way would be to create a hoist and actually hoist it up. And then the other way is with rental equipment, and there might even be two two uh, pieces of rental equipment required because this is a very difficult thing to hang. But the cleats for that have to be custom built and things like that. So um, all of these things uh, would be what, we have a, an estimate in your packet from Castum Contemporary to do all of these things. And what we would propose, we do have funding remaining in the 1% for art for the convention center. Um, we have, and the quote from Castum Contemporary right now is $58,600. The city has also been asked to develop the art marker and put that in place too. We would probably do an art marker with a little more information since kind of a local celebrity is also involved in this. And one of the things that we'd like to look at is using the QR code and having, having it go to the city's website with like a virtual exhibition catalog um, so that we would have images of the work being painted you know, all the way to today. Maybe even some things when it was at Factory Obscura. A little bit more explanation of our local celebrity and Damien Hurst. So I'll be happy to answer any other questions you might have that I didn't cover. Um, but what would happen if the, if the Arts Commission recommends this, then we would go ahead and bring a loan agreement to City Council. We have borrowed the loan agreement from that the Oklahoma City Museum of Art uses, so we feel that that was a, a good one to borrow, and then we would work with our, our municipal counselor's office to modify that to make sure it had all the things that the city normally has in contracts. Commissioner Cooper? Uh, I'm somewhat concerned. I mean, this is a commercial, um, I'm not, well, it, the convention center is a building in which there's a lot of traffic. Mm -hmm. There's no temperature control. I mean, there, there's, it's air conditioned, but as far as having uh, some constant uh, humidity control and temperature control with the ins and outs of movement of activities that go on inside um, uh, this convention space, is that going to cause any kind of deterioration for this piece of art? I don't know. It's exterior paint. Um, I do know, you know, the utilities are on in the convention center 24-7, unless there's a, a, you know, utilities are knocked out because of weather. You know, so that's when they have people that work into the night cleaning spaces after conventions, you know, so it's open all the time. And climate, you know, the climate control is what a human could stand to be in the building. Well, I'm just concerned about if it doesn't, if it's not a condition conducive to the painting, mm -hmm. and it causes some damage to it. I mean, two million dollars, if the loss is on us, on the city, is substantial. So even if an, even if it's under an insurance policy. So question is, I'm assuming there's a condition report that's being done when the piece is accepted. That, so that, that was included with yeah. the case. In. Yeah. So, and if you think about it, Terry, it wasn't in a condition space to begin with when it was nope. at Factory Obscura. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but we weren't responsible yeah. for it then. That's why. Yeah. <laughs> but, but, but is there anything in the agreement that addresses the condition of the piece over that 10 year time period in terms of responsibility? You may have said something about that and I missed it, Robbie. 
we can look at that and we can consult, consult with, um, you know, maybe some more yeah. advisors, museum advisors on that. Because I have to believe they, they understand it's going into a space that will not be conditioned to museum standards. Sure. Yeah, museum I, standards. I understand. I yeah. just was raising the question. Uh, also, I mean, the amount that it's going to take, I don't know what, what we would have set aside for a piece of art that would have been ours and would be permanent uh, for a 10-year loan. And I, I am assuming uh, that it has been determined that that kind of fee uh, is not a bad investment for something that is just on loan as opposed to something that would be permanent. So I did not compare this to other work that could potentially be on loan. No, this was a, a direct uh, request from the Flaming Lips. Would the city like this to be on loan? And staff then researched and evaluated the situation and followed up and obtained what those costs would be and determined that it could be done within our 1% budget. Right. No, I, we did not go out on a selection process, a public selection process for other works that might be available in the community on loan, and we did not do that. So. But the selection committee for the convention center has previously seen this before it came to us. Yes, they did. They saw it. They, uh, they were introduced to it and wanted to wait. And then we brought it back to them after the Susan Narduli's Virtual Sky was completed. And they unanimously, they were very excited about it, um, especially the operator. Um, you can see here what it would look like in the space, that there would be eight and a half foot clearance so that nobody could touch it. Um, it looks really good. The, the image does not do it justice, I think, because when you see it, like when you're over in the space and you can imagine what it's going to look like, it's going to look really amazing. Because a, it's a very neutral palette in that convention center. And so these kinds of pops of color really brighten it up. And the story is really unique, too, that a local celebrity worked with this, you know, internationally known Damien Hirst uh, it, to create. Is this in the ballroom? No, this is not in the, this is out in more of the common areas. Oh, okay. Commissioner Salyer. <laughs> Did we choose this space to be uh, seated right, seated right over a video screen. This was this was after looking at three different sites with the architect. This was the preferred location for it by both the operator and the architect. And then the selection committee agreed that the space. There's not a lot of space left. I mean, when you really think about it, an 18 by 18 foot painting doesn't go in a lot of spaces. There's very few spaces it could go. <coughs> Would there be any option to move that video screen to another location? I don't believe so because I think it's the video screen that convention goers that might be sitting there having meetings or gatherings would find out where their next room is and what time they are. So it, it has a real useful uh, purpose at that site. Commissioner Loftus. Uh, Robbie. Uh the medium, what kind of paint is this? Is it acrylic? Yes, it's household gloss. Well, so I assumed it was ex like an exterior paint, but that's what they term it. In, in a British terms, it is household gloss is the description that I have received. And but, it, it, but it is on canvas, right? Correct. And then do we know if the sun can get to this Painting? No, the sun cannot get to this painting. That was another reason why the architect and the operator preferred this site as well. No sun at all. And then the appraisal, has anybody ever, uh, people that do this kind of appraisal work, has anybody ever said, yeah, this is two and a half million bucks? No, that would need to be done if we took possession. That it, We wouldn't do it beforehand. We would have to go through the process and agree to acquire it and it would be done at one stage in that process. So, and there is, there is one person that we're aware of in Oklahoma City that we believe is the only person in the state that can, that's licensed to do that. But, for, but we, we kind of think it's two million plus or minus, right? 
Most likely, yeah. And then finally, uh, the city has a blanket policy for ensuring things like this, is that right? We do, we have a fine arts rider with Lloyd's of London and it, it costs the city a premium so much per thousand dollars of coverage, so. Okay, so this would add two and a half million dollars worth of coverage to that policy. Right. Okay, thank you, that's it. Yes, thank you. And we would make sure that we had that before we went to council because we expect that question, so. Commissioner Eichmann. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm wondering because of the placement of that video screen, if, the, if that couldn't be used for some of the interpretation of the piece, if the operator might agree to utilize that. I've seen that used with some art where uh, oh, just a screen like back that. And forth, yeah, maybe. yeah, you could actually loop it in as a con it, it constantly. We could ask that. Yeah to flip it, almost like you do like as an info measure on yeah. Fox network. You know, you, you, you talk about doing the, the signage, but yeah. maybe it's actually incorporated into that video screen. Additional comments or questions from commissioner? I would go ahead and make a recommendation that we approve this piece. Okay, are there any? Second. Second. We didn't have any items that needed to be included in that recommendation, correct? Robbie, excuse yeah. the conditions. Uh, do we have any conditions on that? I'm, so, I'm not there. Um, just under the terms proposed, and okay. then we took some <coughs> that. Um, <coughs> let me refer back to my notes here. That we want to do further check on climate. That might be one of the conditions that we would add to that. That make sure that the the lender knows that we're not conditioning it to museum standards. And, and what impact does that have? And then also investigate if the screen can also be used uh, for information about the work itself, like flipping back and forth between the schedule. Um, Commissioner Salyer, do you agree to include those items in your motion? I do include okay. those items in my recommendation. Did, did we have a second on that? A second from Commissioner Eichmann, or lots of seconds. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, pick one. <laughs> any, any further discussion? Hearing none, Mark, can you call a roll call vote for us? Thank you, Madam Chair. Commissioner Bailey? Yes. Commissioner Kovash? Yes. Commissioner Salyer? Yes. Commissioner Chambers? Yes. Commissioner Cooper? Yes. Commissioner Eichmann? Yes. Commissioner Hill? Yes. Commissioner Loftus? Yes. Commissioner Mossant? Yes. Commissioner Seward? Yes. That completes the vote, Madam Chair. The motion passes. Thank you. Item 3C, Welcome to Oklahoma, an interior mural by Rihanna Deck at Will Rogers World Airport, located at 7100 Terminal Drive for the Oklahoma Art and Public Places, Ward 3. Robbie, I believe that you will be presenting this as well. Yes, and we also have, I wanna introduce Jerrica Walsh, who's the director of the Art and Public Places program. Jerrica, if you wanna stand here at this other side podium too. I have a couple of images that I can queue up for you. So this is a project that the state of Oklahoma worked with um, the airport trust and its personnel on. And Jerrica's gonna tell you a little bit about it, but one of the things that I wanted to point out is that staff is recommending with conditions to the airport trust um, verification by the municipal counselor's office that the Skydance Bridge image can be used without a trademark or copyright violation. So, so far, the early evaluation of this seems positive, but we wanted to make sure um, before that was completed. And then also that artist signs a Visual Arts Rights Act waiver. So I'm going to let, because this is Jerrica's project, I'm going <laughs> to let Jerrica, I have a couple, just a couple of slides. Oh, okay, great. For you. So if you want to talk about sure. your wall and things. Yeah. And they have a complete packet with your uh, request for proposals too. Okay. That they can follow along to if you talk about that. Great. All right. So this project is a partnership of the Office of Lieutenant Governor Matt Pinnell, working with the Oklahoma Arts Council's Art and Public Places Program, and then also the Oklahoma Department of Commerce. So in uh, early 2020, Lieutenant Governor Matt Pinnell rolled out the new official brand for the state of Oklahoma, uh, which I'm sure you all have all seen. It's a brightly colored logo. And we have worked with them. This is the second mural now that we have worked together on um, where we are including an artistic interpretation 
of the new official brand in the mural. We did one in the Tulsa International Airport, and then now we're working together on this one for the Will Rogers World Airport. So we, um, I don't know how much information you all need, we uh, ran a request for proposals uh, over the summer and had quite a few applicants. We really targeted it to Oklahoma muralists as we wanted, uh, wanted to make sure that it was an artist living here in Oklahoma that we were uh, offering this opportunity to. We selected, uh, along with the selection committee, uh, five finalists to present, to develop and present their concepts, uh, which they did in September, and Rihanna Deck was uh, the selection of the committee. We've, uh, and you can see her proposal here, so she's got on the left the, uh, her interpretation of the brand uh, over a Native American uh, man's face. Uh, we have the Skydance Bridge, uh, Ferris wheel, state bird, the scissors tail flycatcher. She included a shawl dancer and then a cowboy over on the right. Rihanna is an enrolled member of the Choctaw Nation. And so including the shawl dancer was an important component to her uh, and one that uh, really, you know, resounded well with the, with the committee. Uh, we have reached out to Stan Carroll, who was part of the Skydance Bridge uh, project, and he consented to the use of the image and the mural, was excited to hear that it was included. Um, this mural will be in place uh, for, it's guaranteed to be in place for one year with your approval, of course, uh, with possible extension to one year extension, so potentially up to three years. These are the same conditions that we did in the Tulsa airport as well. Um, and then you can see getting... what the airport wallet baggage claim looks without it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, we're excited to bring so this to it. It, it really will be a big difference. Makes a huge difference. <laughs> so it's not part of the new terminal. It's down in baggage claim. Yeah. And you've seen a previous mural there before that you've recommended. It was by Nick Bear for the Sam Noble Museum. I don't know if some of you that have been on the commission for a while might remember that. So it's that same wall. So. Jerrica, before I open it up for commission questions, can you state your name and address for the record as well? Sure. My home address? Your work address. Your work address is fine. Uh, Jerrica Walsh, 2101 North Lincoln Boulevard, and that's Oklahoma City, 73105. Thank you. Sure. Commissioners, do you have any questions or comments for staff or Jerrica? Yes. Commissioner Kovash? Um, what's the maintenance going to be on this, at least as far as inspecting it and keeping it scuff free? Because that's a pretty bangy. So it will have a Area. clear coat over it to protect it. And then uh, if there are any, you know, significant, um, if there is any significant damage, we've got $1,000 reserved in maintenance funds for any repairs ne as needed. Thank you. Any others? Commissioner Cooper? Uh, uh, tell me again, how long is the proposed life of this mural? So it is for one year guaranteed and then a maximum of three years total. Oh, so in, th in three years it, it'll be gone and replaced with something else? Exactly, yes. And that is actually included in the artist contract, uh, oh. you know, addressing the Visual Artist Rights Act that it is agreed that this will be painted over. It does not require the artist's consent. So they know from the beginning that was also included in the request and the artist orientation. Very clear on <laughs> that it will be painted over. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Loftus. Uh, the medium of uh, paint on this art piece? She'll be using acrylic and latex paints. Will there be any additional lighting for it? There is not any additional lighting planned, no. Thank you. Commissioner Seward. Okay, we have a motion second. and a second from Commissioner Cooper. Any further discussion? Hearing none, can we do a roll call vote, Mark? Thank you, Madam Chair. Commissioner Bailey. Yes. Commissioner Kovash. Yes. Commissioner Salyer. Yes. Commissioner Chambers. Yes. Commissioner Cooper. Yes. Commissioner Eichmann. Yes. Commissioner Hill. Commissioner Loftus. Yes. Commissioner Mossant. Yes. Commissioner Seward. Yes. 
Madam Chair, that completes the vote. The motion passes. Thank, Thank you. you. Item 3D, Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Access Task Force Recommendation for Oklahoma City's Pre-Qualified Artist Pool, and this is applicable to all wards. Commissioner Chambers, would you like to present this item? It, uh, at least kick off the presentation, um, much of which will come from staff in detail. However, I'm excited to share in the short time that we've had as a task force we did identify um, several areas that we would like to explore, including things that we could do fairly quickly. And I'm, I'm happy to say that it's our city staff who responded so qu quickly with this. And, and then, as always, interdepartmental fashion, the collaboration between the Office of Arts and Cultural Affairs with our city's own procurement office was able to move quickly with one, addressing one of these issues that we raised. Robbie. Yes, thank you, thank you, Commissioner. So, so Randy and I have been really wanting to work with a task force on um, this diversity, equity, inclusion, and we, you know, we've had a lot of training over the last two years, and we were all challenged in the planning office to come up with, you know, some items that really could be change makers for the city. And the biggest one that we had identified was the pre-qualified pool. You know, this is a very early project that when we were working with the consultant on the public art master plan, uh, she came up with this idea and we implemented it before the master plan was even completed. And at that time, we were not using um, the online enrollment system BidSync. We were, you know, it was at the time when an artist could just submit their submissions by email and we would go ahead and process them. And so at that time, it made a lot of sense for, you know, to announce something once a year through the city council and to go ahead and receive submissions by a certain date, to go through a little mini jury of arts professionals and then present something to the Arts Commission, you know, a case for artists within these media we want to recommend, it may, because that's how we started. Then, then we transitioned as a city to every, everything we do requires BidSync. And BidSync is, is a system that's really made for vendors and contractors, like general contractors. Um, many, you know, it's, it's highly a technological use. Um, and kind of how I explained it to the procurement office is, you know, if you're a general contractor, you might have two or three staff people dedicated to technical things. You know, they like those really itty bitty, you know, detailed things and they're really good on computers and that's what they do all day. And then you have other people that have soft skills and marketing skills and all these things. Well, we ask artists to have all those skills, right? And some artists just really have a hard time getting through the nitty gritty technical stuff that BidSync requires. So we've, we've, we've transitioned to announcing this every year through council and BidSync. And, and what we've thought because of the way we do it, we're kind of overdoing the process. And this is what we want to kind of peel back the process a little bit. And so in talking to procurement, they agreed, you know, according to state law, when we have a project that's under $25,000, and that's what the pre-qualified pool was designed, only for projects under 25,000, we can do what we call soft bidding, which means we really only have to consider three, three bids. Now, if we could transition to an artist registry that was very simple, we, as a matter of practice, Randy and I, when we have a project under $25,000, we re-announce that project to the pre-qualified pool in that category. You know, so let's say they're mural artists. We go ahead and develop a two to three page request for information, we call it. And it's just super simple and it has the dates, what we're looking for, what the process is. We send it out to all the artists in the murals category because we know they're in the pre-qualified pool in that, and we ask them to respond if they're interested, and if they would like to, we give them the option to update their images. Well, we could do the same thing if we had a registry, and we knew that there, you know, instead of having maybe 20 artists in the pre-qualified pool, we might have 50 artists that were in the registry as mural artists. We could send them the RFI, ask them to respond, and if they had painted a few new murals 
between the time they registered and that, the date that they received the RFI, they could update that information. And that's the information we show to the selection committee. It still goes through selection committee every time. So we've been kind of doing a double selection for the projects under $25,000. The other advantage of looking at an artist registry in this way is artists can register all through the year. They don't have to wait until staff prepares the annual pre-qualified pool announcement, queues it up for council's consideration. This can just be a standard registry that we have open every day of the year, every hour of the day that they can do from their home computers. So in talking to the procurement office, it was really good timing for what they were considering because the city has taken a, a, a very strong approach to hiring vendors that are small business and minority owned. They've been working with a consultant to revamp our vendor registration system because right now vendors have to send us forms and, and staff has to input those forms just to get vendors as a whole registered. So this new system will allow all vendors of the city to register online themselves. And so it'll be more accurate information. And procurement was really excited that we could have a category within the city's vendor system called artists. And then within that artist category, we could have the subcategories for the mediums that they work. This would make um, artists available to every part of the city you know, there, we get asked from time to time by other departments, do you have any graphic artists you could, you know, recommend or any of these other things? Everybody would have access to this system. We would go ahead and have a link from the planning department, the arts website, to, you know, register as an artist, and it would be artists at okc.gov, so they could register themselves. Once they got their information uploaded, Randy or I would review it and approve it, and it would go on and it would, they would pre-register, pre-load all of their vendor information with you know, things like their tax ID numbers and stuff. And these are all things that have delayed projects in the past. So it would happen very quickly. And we feel like that it would really help us recruit a lot more new talent. Because we have noticed in the last year we're getting less and less entries and interest from the pre-qualified pool, because the pre-qualified pool is very busy with a lot of different pursuits. And so um, we're pretty excited about this. I wanted to go ahead and, and let you know some of the things that, that we see as requirements of even recommending this. And that is that the registration method should be as simple and streamlined as possible so that it's easy for artists, like that they could do it from their phone and not have to be sitting in front of a computer, that it would be ongoing throughout the year and not just an annual announcement, that we would want to have some information gathering about the individual artists in order to track our success about diversity goals. So this would be if, if they would want to tell us you know, their, their background, that we would be able to track that through time and see if we were meeting certain goals. That all of the recruitment information, the other thing that procurement told us is they're going to start bringing information and people to a lot of the town halls and other big public meetings that our elected officials have. And so they could also bring information about artists and from time to time staff could even, part our staff could participate, but also because they have much larger staff that they would be willing to you know, to intake some of these for us as well. And I explained to you how we would notify the artists in the registry for a project with an RFI, and that we would continue to do that. And again, that this registry would only be for artists that were um, wanted to be considered for projects under $25,000. So the state law requires that anything over $25,000 has to be approved by council. And in, in those cases, we would still use BidSync for those. You know, that's where you graduate to. You have to be able to use BidSync. And we, we think that some of the artists that maybe have a lot of difficulty using BidSync now, that because we would know who they were and be working with them more, that we would help them graduate to that level, you know, within a few years' time. 
So I'll be happy to answer any other questions you might have. Commissioner Kovash. This is a three-part question. I'll ask them all at once because I think you can just cover all three of them. Um, is it really necessary to have categories in this uh, registry? Um, can you help me understand that? Because maybe somebody, I think that would make it too m micro instead of macro. So the categories we use like if, if murals, you know, or three-dimensional work, or if somebody just wants glass, we really do need ca some categories. Written word is another one. Um, be, because we need to know what the artist has experience in and how, how they portray themselves as an artist. They can elect more than one category. An artist can come in and register under five categories or more if they feel like they have examples, you know, experience in all those categories. But we really do need to be a little bit surgical so we're not just sending it to the entire pool. That's our opinion, staff's opinion. Um, so we're not just sending to everybody in the pool because we might be sending information to artists that don't have experience in that area and they might all of a sudden go, oh, well, I want to be considered. And then it's going to be a waste of time for the selection committee if they don't have projects that the selection committee can even view. Um, but I, I would like to go on record to say that I disagree with that. And okay. I think that the RFI should go out to everybody in the registry because okay. that would encourage more diversity as opposed to less diverse. I mean, this whole thing is about diversity. So if somebody who was in the written word category got something for a sculptor, maybe they, they would want to team up with somebody else. And it would be their idea, not the sculptor's idea. So I, I, I think there could be a lot more synthesis, maybe is the right word, between the different artists in the registry if you didn't categorize them. I mean, certainly they could state them, but I think the RFI should go out to everybody. And it, that doesn't cost any more. It's like an email, right? No, it's just an email. Right. In fact, it makes it easy. Yeah. I mean, if you just send it to everybody in right. the registry. And I think it would encourage artists to, to maybe increase their portfolio more okay. that way. Kind of show them where the opportunities are coming from. Or, or yeah. that and also let them have the chance to bid on something outside their envelope, maybe. And who knows what it might turn into. And I don't think you'd lose anything by doing that. Okay. Uh, second would be, is how much workload is this going to be on the planning staff? Um, it's always workload. I mean, you, you trade one thing for another, mm -hmm. you know. I mean, it just is what it is. But it's meeting a major important goal for mm -hmm. both the city and the Arts Commission mm -hmm. and the planning department. Sure. Uh, so it's priceless, I guess, is what I'm trying to <laughs> Oh, I, I agree. Yeah. Um, and then um, the evaluation. You, you still have to get three, right? At least three, or you have to oh, evaluate Oh, so we would, we, would, we would receive, you know, we would receive as many as, as we got back and go through a regular selection committee. You've been on some of these oh, smaller selections. Oh, so you, it wouldn't be in-house? It would still, no, we, staff would not select these. They would still go through our regular selection committee so you process, but what we're trying to do is eliminate that first big one, mm -hmm. you know, and the bid sync and going through all that technical process and only getting to do that once a year to be in the pre-qualified pool. This mm -hmm. would just be an ongoing registry. Mm -hmm. And so it would still have the standard se selection committee that was set up for that project, you know, with the arts commissioner and the professional art juror, you know, architect, landscape architect, um, and the stakeholders that would be involved in that type of project. Sure. Thank they, you. Yeah. Commissioner Cooper. Um, Robbie, I, I'm thinking that I recall from a past s statement from, from you or someone else on staff that you have used the pre-qualified pool to make uh, referrals to people who have asked for artists to do work, not necessarily for city work, but are asking for the names of people and that the people in the pre-qualified pool yes. uh, are, are get references from the city to other people. That's right. Who are looking for artistic services. Right. So, so, for, so the categories would be important for those people they would. To, to be able to select. They would be important for that, but I also get that maybe when we're announcing, we announce to everybody yeah. the project. But you're, you're exactly right. One of the things we thought um, that we were considering as well was going ahead and collecting like a social media handle, like an Instagram handle. Because so many artists, like if we're, 
you know, uh, referring the mural list, say, to somebody that's looking for a mural artist, they could quickly go on those Instagram sites and see the kind of work those artists did. And so many of our artists do use social media. If they didn't use Instagram, we could, you know, we could collect Facebook or whatever so that the member of the public that was looking, it's almost like they're using them as their portfolios anyway. to every plumber, um, plumber, roofer, you know, all these different categories and hope that somebody responds? Or do they have it more specialized is that we've got a plumbing problem, we want a plumber? Right. I mean, so how's, how's so annually, annually they send out, here's an announcement for plumbers, and then they go through a process, and then they have the preferred plumbers in the, in the vendor list. So, and so that way staff, if staff from any department of the city wanted a plumber, they could go to that list in the vendor system and then obtain three bids. Wouldn't go to the roofer and everybody else, right? Pardon? So then it wouldn't go to the roofer and all those other people, right? Right, yeah. I, I, I tend to like the more simplified. Yeah, uh, but it helps direct staff, you know, to what they, so if, if anybody in the city, you know, you know, the police department wants an artist, you know, they could even go to the, they might call us and ask our opinion or for some guidance. But also, um, you know, just even in succession planning, we're trying to do a lot of training of other parts of the city in what art selection is. Art selection is so similar to every other contractor and vendor selection we do at the city. I mean, it's based on all the same laws. So the more that people in the city have access to these things and understand this is the process and the process can be written and we can go through it with them and provide technical assistance, this really does expand the opportunities for artists too. So we're like really excited that artists could be part of the vendor system. They won't, in the initial rollout of it, they'll still be separated, but the idea is that eventually they would be part of the major vendor system. Is what we're trying to do roll back the barrier that BidSync yes. is putting up for some of our Well, it's projects. twofold to it. I don't want to blame it only on BidSync, but at the time we needed to know who the artists were. <clears throat> And the only way to do that, you know, because we had one staff person, remember, running the entire Office of Arts and Cultural Affairs. So there wasn't a lot of recruitment time there. So an annual announcement, doing social media, and all of you circulating it, you know, um, that seemed to be a really good vehicle to just use an annual time to announce the pre-qualified pool. You know, and then BidSync be did become a barrier, but also now we think only using an annual announcement is a barrier. We think that, you know, artists emerge, you know, they graduate from college in May. They may work with somebody on a project in the summer and go, I can do this, you know, and, and, and they might, you know, travel to a, a, another state or another country in the winter and come back and go, I did all this training, I want to be able to compete too. So it's, it's kind of like these opportunities for artists, they come up all through the year and making them wait, we think, is a huge barrier to apply to be in the pre-qualified pool. Um, Commissioner Kovash had a question. Uh, yep, and I, I need to reiterate, if, if we oversimplify it and just send them out to plumbers and roofers, then we're gonna get plumbers and roofers. I understand the metaphor. Yeah. Um, it, art is not building a house. So you, you, there's so many opportunities for th synthesis. I think it's important to put classifications, especially if private entities are gonna to come to you looking for a glass person or a mirror person or something like that. But if you send out the uh, RFI to everybody, which is just one button pushing, um, they're gonna know, uh, you know, the, the written word person is gonna look for the sculptor and maybe they can find a way to team. Yeah, you know, I can see there's a lot more um, opportunities for collaboration mm -hmm. and team building with yeah. that. So yeah. that would be a great idea to go ahead and do it that way. And that's all. Yeah. Commissioner Cooper? Um, I really, uh, well, I say I appreciate because I'm not an artist, so it doesn't go necessarily to my direct benefit, but I appreciate the city doing all this to, to simplify it, make, make the whole system more accessible, um, and to have uh, artists included among vendors. But as with the sign code, 
I think it is really important to maintain that separate category of artists because I don't want artists treated just as another city vendor, right. just like I don't want art to be treated like another city sign. Right. I we know heard, you're tired of me that saying and, that, but I keep pounding that drum. <laughs> we hear that loud and clear and are in total agreement there. So. Any other comments, questions? I would open the floor for a motion. And this would be a recommendation to um, to proceed. This would to go proceed, straight to if, proceed with this administrative change. Correct, because so, this would all be administrative. This doesn't go further to council. This is a recommendation from the Arts Commission for staff to proceed down this path and make it happen. So we we have a motion from Commissioner Cooper. Is there a second? Second. Second from Commissioner Kovash. Any further discussion? Okay, Mark, can you perform a roll call vote? Thank you, Madam Chair. Commissioner Bailey. Yes. Commissioner Kovash. Yes. Commissioner Salyer? Yes. Commissioner Chambers? Yes. Commissioner Cooper? Yes. Commissioner Eichmann? Yes. Commissioner Hill? Yes. Commissioner Loftus? Yes. Commissioner Mossant? Yes. Commissioner Seward? Yes. Madam Chair, that completes the vote. The motion passes. Thank you. We are now to item four, the consent docket, and we have two items this month. 4A is Come Together, a sidewalk mural by Angie LaPaglia and Kiana Millerons. 300 Park Avenue for Downtown OKC Partnership in ULI, Oklahoma. This is a 2021 ULI micro grant, and it is in Ward 6. And then also um, item 4B, Bellamos Let's Dance, an exterior mural by Nick Bayer, 525 Southwest 29th Street for the Southwest 29th Street District in Ward 4. Robbie, can you present these cases? Yes, I'll go through these. I want to say on both of these items, we have applicants here so that if the, even though these are on the consent docket, if the Arts Commission wanted to hear from either of the applicants, we do have them here. So the first, the come together sidewalk mural, here's the site in front of the downtown library that is proposed. Of course, the city of Oklahoma City is the property owner on this and the, the Metro library system is the operator. And so this particular project, Public Works, is the own, owning department. So we did go back and forth a little bit on investigating. At first it was proposed being um, painted directly on, and there might have been some issues and st some stormwater concerns, things like that. But then we came back um, and talked to the artists about using what Embark uses very successfully on downtown sidewalks. They're like sidewalk clings is the, you know, kind of the slang word for it. And the artists were really excited because then it allowed them to go back and redesign. They could do some things with that method, the cling and the wrap, that they couldn't do with the paint. So um, here is a closer up view of the site. And then here's their revamped design. Um, after they checked out the materials that were um, recommended by Embark and, and um, looked at that a little bit more. I wanted to talk to you about some of the conditions that we've recommended on this. Um, we want the, that the artist signed Visual Arts Rights Act waivers. This would go under a public art installation and maintenance agreement to the city council because it's being proposed as being on site for a year. And so normally when we do it for just a few months, we do an administrative revocable. But because this is being proposed for a year, we even talked to the city manager's office and we just thought it would be a better idea to go, to go ahead and have a formal agreement through council. Um, we think that uh, maintenance needs to be addressed by identifying an individual or an entity to conduct a monthly check on the condition of the mural and then remove it early if it shows signs of deterioration or if it's in poor condition. Um, and as we've done in other projects with the Downtown OKC Partnership and ULI, we've asked for a letter of guarantee because they're a large organization that can move swiftly and come in and remove things while sometimes individuals have life gets in the way. So that we would ask for that again. Um, a licensed sign contractor that would install the mural would provide the city of Oklahoma City with our required insurance before they um, actually applied this. That development services would issue a sign permit for a mural. And I already mentioned that city council would, would approve the public art installation and maintenance agreement. So do you have any questions before I move on to the next on the consent docket? Okay. 
So, Balamos, let's dance. Here's the site. Some of you may know this as um, Jude and Jody's furniture, I believe, in the, in the south part of Oklahoma City. And there's this terrific wall that just screams, I want a mural on me. And what a great design. Um, the Southwest 29th District had a special committee that convened to actually write a call to artists. And uh, we helped them quite a bit with that, gave them a technical assistance, and then also helped them promote it. We even promoted this on the city's website for a time. And in the end, they selected this, um, this design by Nick Baer. It's quite beautiful. And we have no conditions that we've recommended on this. It, it seemed like everything was turned in that would be norm normally required. And like I said, both applicants are here if you had any questions or comments for them. Um, seeing none, I would open the floor for a motion. I move to recommend. Second. I move consent, rather. Consent, that's <laughs> correct. And I second that consent. Um, <laughs> any further discussion? Seeing none, Mark, can you perform a roll call vote for us? Thank you, Madam Chair. Commissioner Bailey? Yes. Commissioner Kovash? Yes. Commissioner Salyer? Yes. Commissioner Chambers? Yes. Commissioner Cooper? Yes. Commissioner Eichmann? Yes. Commissioner Hill? Yes. Commissioner Loftus? Yes. Commissioner Mossant? Yes. Commissioner Seward? Yes. Madam Chair, that completes the vote. The motion passes. Thank you. Madam Chair? Yes. Could I ask a question, please? Yes. Um, what is the difference between consent docket and items for discussion action? So we have individual items for discussion action where you vote following each one. And it's because they might be different from each other. You know, one is a loan of a painting, one might be a 1%, one might be a report from a task force. So they're very different from each other and they require individual votes. Consent docket requires a vote, but it's lumping um, like, like things, like all the plates we're gonna to bring to you together. You know, so we're bringing all the murals to you together. And also it's because we're not reviewing content, we're just reviewing, the, reviewing them in the eyes of the policy that you've already agreed to as an arts commissioner that this is how I review. So staff presents them to you in a, in a block. Like we've reviewed these according to the standards that you've already established and here's our report to you. And then when you vote on them, you vote on them as a block on a consent docket. Does that help? That helps. Okay. I would add, Robbie, that at any time, if there is an item considered part of the consent docket, any commissioner may be asked to have that item moved and further considered separately. Um, it's it's an good. efficiency yeah. that usually does not exist in Robert's rules or parliamentary procedures. Right, because you can ask that an item be deferred. You know, for instance, like council does this too. Council has a consent docket. And you can, um, you can ask questions about it and you might want something deferred to another meeting if you feel like there wasn't enough information presented. Well, I've had a lot of experience with consent dockets and usually somebody has decided these are okay and they <laughs> present 14 pieces and they say, here it is. Let's go on to something else. And it's not quite as detailed as this was, so I'm okay. as confused as usual. <laughs> our, our staff is an overachiever on information. <laughs> um, item five, discussion action on reports from committees. 5A, Commission Advocate, Commissioner Salyer, do you have anything to report? Madam Chairman, I really don't. I just think I want to congratulate our arts organizations for an amazing summer of just blockbuster yes. exhibits and to sadly report that our frescoes are back on their way to Naples and, <laughs> and other things. Um, we've also got some really interesting upcoming acquisitions of pieces of work at various institutions that I hope we'll be able to talk about coming forward. So Excellent. that would be my report. Thank you. Item 5B, Arts and Culture Building Tr Trust Task Force. Um, this is me and Commissioner Chambers. Um, we don't have anything to report at this time. I think we'll have an upcoming report after another meeting um, this fall. Is that correct, staff? Yeah. Okay, thank you. That is. Item 5C, Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Access Task Force. This is Commissioner Chambers and Tiffany McKnight. In addition to what we talked about earlier in this meeting, do you have anything else to report? Thank you. Um, 
we were able to present something that we could move quickly on and, and address the list of our three priorities. Um, I highly doubt that anything will move that quickly again. Um, <laughs> as far as it comes to the work of the task force, it will require much more deliberation, time, and of course, listening. Mm -hmm. So look forward to more from the task force in the coming months. Thank, Thank you. you. Item six, staff report. Robbie? So on our 1% for art projects, our public art project manager, Randy Marks, um, has shown um, there's one completion by MJ Alexander for the Northeast Rec Center. This is a lenticular mural, and it will be behind acrylic. It's actually not installed yet, but it's completed. So, <laughs> so we wanted to go ahead and report it. And then we had two private completions last month. We had the People Mural by Armando Ortiz and Ascend by Don Narcomy. That is one in the Plaza District that got installed right before the Plaza Festival. And we did have 39 technical assistants last month. So I'm gonna start reporting those to you so you can understand the volume. You know, the previous month, I think there was something like 80 something. So we do spend a lot of time and track technical assistance month to month and report on those. Thank you. That's a, that's a valuable asset mm -hmm. in our community, the technical assistance that your staff provides. Item seven, comments from commission members. Do you have anything that you would like to add, commissioners? Seeing none. Um, item eight, any public comments? Seeing no public members here, <laughs> I'm going to say that's a no. And a reminder to everyone that our next meeting is November 15th, 2021, and that is held in, held in person here in city council chambers at 4 p.m. We are adjourned. Thank you.